Welcome to another Eric Waite Whiskey Study. I'm a certified sommelier with the Court of Master Sommeliers and a French wine scholar with the Wine Scholar Guild, no certified whiskey ambassador. I'm a big fan of Japanese whiskeys. Uh, an absolutely fantastic book on Japanese whiskeys is David Broom's uh, The Way of Whiskey. Read this book and I think you'll fall in love with everything about ja Japanese whiskeys and what's behind it, which is the Japanese culture. When I read this book, I just wanted to then jump on a plane and go visit distilleries. The problem is Japanese whiskey uh, is experiencing a shortage. So the importance of, of understanding this, the cause and effects, what's going on now and what's coming down uh, the pipeline is, there have been booms and busts in the Scotch whiskey industry and in the American whiskey industry. In the 1800s, uh, Scotch whiskey had a, a boom, and then in the, in the 1920s, it had a bit of a bust. And then again, in the 1980s, Scotch whiskey had a bust. And right now, Scotch whiskey is uh, experiencing a boom with a rapid growth and uh, a rebuilding of some um, dead distilleries and also building of new distilleries in Scotland. So studying the history of whiskey worldwide, and then particularly uh, in Scotland, the United States, and Japan, you got to get a, an understanding of the causes and effects of why there are booms and busts, not only in terms of if you're in the whiskey business, but if you're a whiskey fan, so you can make wise choices and know what's coming down the pike and know what to look out for. So in this video, I want to do uh, a little bit of a study of uh, Japanese whiskey and why there is a whiskey shortage. So movie fans and Japanese whiskey aficionados may recall Bill Murray's famous line from the 2003 Academy Award winning picture, Loss in Translation. For relaxing times, make it Suntory time. The whiskey he is toasting towards the camera was a Hibiki 17-year-old, a flagship single malt and grain blend from Suntory's Hakushu Distillery. But those relaxing times provided by Hibiki will soon be over because Suntory is holding production of their best-selling Hibiki whiskey, the Hibiki 17-year-old. In addition, the Hakushu 12-year-old single malt is disappearing. It takes a minimum of 12 years to create the 12 year old Hibiki. It's a complex blend of over 30 different single malts, of which only the youngest is actually 12 years old. Other vintage Japanese whiskeys may soon be disappearing from shelves as well. The current shortage could last up to 10 years before the supply returns to a level that age statement Japanese whiskeys return to the market. Now, a simplified explanation for the planned obsolescence of many Japan's most popular whiskeys is that they have, in a sense, become too popular, and as a result, suppliers are dwindling. But there's more to it than that. Brian Ashcraft, author of Japanese Whiskey, The Ultimate Guide to the World's Most Desirable Spirit and Tasting Notes from Japan's Leading Whiskey Blogger, says that the shortage can be attributed to several factors. In spite of Suntory having invested more than $250 million since 2013 to increase production in their Yamazaki and Hokusha distilleries, the fairly recent and unexpected rise in demand for Japanese single malts and blends has caught the industry off guard. Just as the boom in American bourbon has resulted in current shortages of some of the most popular U.S. brands, but while American distillers are ramping up production and resorting to allocations, some of their Japanese counterparts are trying to catch up on the aging process by keeping their whiskeys in barrels and away from the bottling plant in order to have sufficient quantities of aged spirits for the future. Now, there are several causes for uh, the Japanese whiskey shortage. The first is reduced production of Japanese whiskey due to diminished domestic popularity. Approximately 20 years ago, Japanese whiskey was at a decades-long nadir of popularity, so distilleries didn't set enough aside in their aging warehouses. 10 years ago, the drink had fallen completely out of fashion following a boom in sales of Western liquor in the 1970s and 1980s. Additionally, younger consumers showed little interest 
in what was seen as a harsh tasting old man's drink. Consumption fell by nearly a third to 75 million liters between 1989 and 2008, according to the data from the National Tax Agency. The second reason is increased domestic popularity of Japanese whiskey. Japanese whiskey gained popularity due to a 2014 television drama called Masan about Masataka Takatsuru, the father of Japanese whiskey and founder of the Nika distillery, which led to a domestic rise in sales of Japanese whiskey. The third is an increased international popularity of Japanese whiskey. In 2014, Suntory's Yamazaki Single Malt Sherry Cask 2013 was named the world's best whiskey in Jim Murray's Whiskey Bible of 2015, something the author described as a wake-up call for the Scotch producers who regularly topped the list. The award also came at a time when tourism in Japan was booming. The number of foreign tourists visiting the country tripled between 2012 and 2017. Now, there have been several uh, responses to the shortages by Japanese whiskey producers. The first is Suntory replaced age statement whiskeys with non-age statement whiskeys. And we see a lot of this going on in Scotland right now as well. In 2015, Suntory pulled the Hibiki 12-year-old whiskey and replaced it with a variety called Hibiki Harmony, a non-age statement whiskey bottling. The second is Nika replaced age statement whiskeys with non-age statement whiskeys as well. Nika Distillery discontinued its line of ultra-aged whiskeys, replacing them with non-age statement whiskey bottlings. One of the best is the multi-cask blended Nika from the barrel, uh, which can be found for around $65 to $90 here in the United States, which was introduced in Japan in 1986 and became available in the USA in August 2018. Nika, whiskey from the barrel, is produced at Nika's Yoichi and Miyagiko distilleries and is composed of more than 100 different single malt and grain whiskeys that have been aged in ex-bourbon barrels and punchins, as well as in ex-sherry butts that have been refilled, recharred, and remade into hogsheads. This pot-stilled whiskey is enhanced by an additional three to six months of aging in Nika cellars and is bottled at a high 51.4% alcohol by volume. Another response has been the ceasing of production of some bottlings. Suntory's Shiro Kaku, which means white kaku, was suspended in March 2019 in Japan. Originally launched in 1992, Shiro Kaku is an inexpensive whiskey that is a lighter version of the ubiquitous Suntory Kakubin, a solid yet affordable highball whiskey. In addition, production of the small 350 milliliter bottling of the Cheetah, a grain whiskey, and the 450 milliliter supermarket and convenience store only Kakubin bottling have also been halted. According to Sankey News, the decision was made to pull the Kirin Sanruku blended whiskey due to spirit shortages. Kirin doesn't have enough of the stuff to ensure a stable blend and has had to pull the blend. Kirin Sanruku is distilled at the Kirin Kotembra distillery at the base of Mount Fuji. Another response has been the rebranding of whiskeys as mixers. Suntory launched a campaign to broaden the appeal of whiskey and marketing it as a mixer in highball cocktails, made popular in bars, restaurants, and promoted at whiskey events, complete with branded jugs and glasses. The cocktail quickly became a fixture on Izakaya pub menus, and Suntory extended its reach into households with a highly successful canned version at supermarkets. Another response has been the establishment of new Japanese distillers. In response to the shortage, there has been a boom in new distilleries, which has rejuvenated Japanese whiskey industry on many levels, and a number of entrepreneurs have taken over shuttered distilleries and launched their own brands. That should sound familiar because the same thing is going on in Scotland right now. Venture Whiskey, for example, operates a small distillery just north of Tokyo. Its product, Ichiro's Malt, has earned rave reviews across the world and is now highly sought after by collectors. One of the problems in response to all this is that there has also been a rise in whiskey fraud. 
uh, with the rise of importing foreign whiskey and relabeling it as Japanese whiskey. While there is a shortage of Japanese whiskey, suddenly there are new Japanese brands from previously unknown distillers and bottlers appearing on the market. How can this be the case if stocks are limited and industry doesn't exchange fillings and the new whiskey distilleries, which have been recently still have no mature stock? Well, the answer lies in Japan's loose regulations governing whiskey, which permits blends of imported and domestic whiskey to be sold as Japanese and allows whiskey to be used as a term for a spirit made with as little as 10% whiskey blended with any neutral spirit. Although the spirit cannot be exported, producers can bottle 100% imported spirit and sell it globally as Japanese. In another loophole, aged rice and barley shochu distilled in stainless steel stills can be legally sold as whiskey in the U.S. market. Ironically, this would be illegal in Japan and in the EU because shochu, like sake, uses koji, which is a mold, to convert starches into sugars. In the U.S., however, shochu can be labeled as whiskey as long as it is cereal-based and matured in oak. The problem is there's no clear definition of Japanese whiskey. We saw the same thing in the United States when there was no clear uh, definition of whiskey or bourbon, and it took the government to step in uh, to get it regulated. In fact, it was President Taft who really stepped and did this. If you want to read more about that taking place here in the United States, uh, you want to read um, Bourbon Justice by Brian Herrera. And this same place is taking place uh, in Scotland as well. So the problem is there is no clear legal definition of Japanese whiskey, which is applicable to all countries. And that the meaning of this word has therefore become quite wide and vague. In the case of rice whiskeys, it doesn't seem to be causing confusion as they clearly label it as such. The problem is due to the lack of regulations, there is an increase of many producers who are trying in many random ways to find a loophole in order to benefit from the consumer's thirst for Japanese whiskey. In doing so, they are diminishing the reputation and status of the image of Japanese whiskey. Currently, 27 Japanese firms are importing bulk Scotch whiskey, while the Scotch Whiskey Association figures reveal that in the last past five years, there has been a fourfold increase in bulk shipments to Japan. In 2017, bulk blended malt exports rose to 1.4 million liters, an increase of 17% of the previous year, while bulk grain shipments reached 1.7 million liters. Some of this may be destined for low-level blends. Some, however, seems destined to reappear in the world market as Japanese whiskey. But none of these producers of anything less than 100% Japanese whiskeys are doing anything illegal. Because the whiskey regulations in Japan are so loose, it's hard to make a watertight case against these people. While they are acting in bad faith and diminishing the reputation of Japanese whiskey, they're not breaking any laws. And again, we had this same thing happen here in the United States, same thing happened in Scotland, and that's why we had such things as bottled in bond. I'm not going to go into talk about bottled in bond and bourbon, but when things get abused, um, that's when regulations get increased. And so Japan is going to have to go through a similar um, reformation, if you want to call it that, that Scotland had to go through, that the United States had to go to regarding classifications and regulations of whiskey. While none of the new brands are technically doing anything illegal, all the major and established producers agree that consumers are confused and, at worst, are being deceived. Part of the problem is that the blending of imported and domestic whiskey is an old established practice. The majority of the low priced blends from the majors are in this way. The question is, now that the market has changed so fundamentally, should this be de declared on the label? Chichibu, for example, states whether a whiskey is a multi-nation blend on the label, but it is a rare exception. So there is a need for Japanese whiskey classification regulations. While there is a consensus among the established producers that the current situation is 
uh, potentially damaging, the situation cannot change because of the lack of regulations. All agree that there is a need for a comprehensive definition of Japanese whiskey and a new regulatory framework. Suntory's chief blender, Shinji Fukuyu, says while this was ultimately an issue for the Japan Spirits and Liquors Makers Association, Suntory strongly believes that actual products must not be different from the image of Japanese whiskey that comes to the consumer's mind, adding that there is currently a working group from the association working on a new definition. While he feels that it's up to the body to work out the new regulations, he thinks the term Japanese whiskey should be applied to an age spirit that has been made in Japan. While there appears to be ongoing debate over issues such as minimum age and whether oak should be the only permitted wood type, there is agreement that the laws as they stand are too loose. So the Japanese whiskey laws don't necessarily need to be identical to scotch, they do need to be similar. So what is the market result of short supply and high demand? Now, the first is whiskey hoarding and increased prices. This is likely to mean that many of the wonderful whiskeys will remain on collector shelves rather than being consumed as they are becoming rare and revered collector's items. And for some buyers, Japanese whiskey has become an investment, something they can sell later for a higher price. And it's a shame that we can't simply enjoy these whiskeys anymore. Hibiki 17 is currently selling for as high as $600 in the USA, while Hakushu 12 selling for $190 in the USA. And another problem has been counterfeit Japanese whiskeys. By that, I don't mean the importing of whiskey from other countries and calling it Japanese, but rather um, people getting a hold of empty, rare Japanese whiskeys and then filling them with another spirit and then reselling it uh, as if it was the, uh, uh, the genuine article. The same thing has happened in the wine industry, the same thing has happened in scotch, uh, whiskey industry, same thing has happened here in the United States. You know, th there's nothing new under the sun. Uh, when there's shortage uh, and, and a lack of supply and there's a high demand, people are gonna be fraudulent. People are gonna do Ill illegal things because they're gonna look for an opportunity. They're gonna look for people who are looking to get uh, a special buy on something that's really hard to find and they're gonna offer it at low prices. And so um, the result is you need to know how to read a label, know how to tell the differences, what has changed uh, in terms of uh, the plastic coating. And distilleries are gonna have to come up with unique methods of ensuring that once the bottle has been opened, if they try to reseal it in some other fashion, uh, that it can be uh, detected. So in conclusion, you know, Suntory stresses that maintaining high standards will be crucial to growth and that compromising a quality will hurt the Japanese whiskey industry in the long run but the company may have a hard time convincing retailers who feel the need to be missing out on an opportunity. So this is sort of my biggest concern with the Japanese whiskey industry is supply, demand, people want it, people want to fill that, fill that desire, um, they obviously want to make a buck, is because the regulations are loose, they'll start cutting corners. When you cut quarters and you diminish the quality of the whiskey, you diminish the brand and the name and the reputation of the whiskey, and consequently, in the long run, the demand will drop because why is somebody gonna buy a Japanese whiskey when there's a high suspicion that it may be fake or that the quality is really, really low? So while there may be a, an immediate profit from cutting corners, in the long run, it's only gonna hurt the industry. But the greedy don't think long-term, they think in the immediate, uh, and how can they, they can make a, a quick buck. Alrighty, so we're looking at a 10 year turnaround. I'm 53 years old. By the time things start turning around, I'll be 63 years old. And in the meantime, well, I've got you know a, a little Japanese collection here. I may pick up a few that I can still uh, find here locally at some of the uh, smaller mom and pop whiskey shops. You're gonna pay a premium for them, but I'll probably still pick up a, a, a few more. Um, one of the best, as previously mentioned, that I really, really like is uh, this is the Nika whiskey from the barrel. An absolutely fantastic whiskey. It was the 2018 number one whiskey of the Whiskey Advocate. I've already reviewed this. I'm going to be doing also a premiere video with a fellow sommelier 
Um, and we're going to talk about Japanese whiskey. So you want to keep a, a, an eye out for that if you haven't seen it already. This is an example of how they can still maintain a high quality whiskey, make a non age statement whiskey, meet the demand of high quality whiskeys, and it has the integrity of a Japanese style. One of the things that the Japanese whiskey needs to do is maintain its uniqueness in the whiskey world and not try to become something else. And that's the other thing. If you're importing whiskey and call it Japanese whiskey, and yet it's from Canada, the United States, or Scotland, or something like that, then it's not going to smell or taste like a Japanese whiskey. And so the, the, the consequence is the term Japanese whiskey actually ends up becoming absolutely meaningless, particularly by, uh, you know, if somebody who isn't familiar with Japanese whiskey and they taste it and they go, oh, that's Japanese whiskey. Gee, it tastes like or smells like a cheap uh, Canadian blend or a uh, cheap uh, scotch blend. Why would I want to buy that? All right. So um, I hope you have enjoyed this video. Uh, this is just sort of a microcosm of what goes on in, in the boom and bust patterns in the history of whiskey. I'm going to be doing some other videos on Scotland uh, in preparation for study, probably in June uh, 2019. And I'll be getting into a little bit uh, in that. Uh, as well. All right. Uh, if you subscribe to this channel, I want to thank you very much. If you haven't yet subscribed, but you like watching my videos, I would greatly appreciate it if you would subscribe. Give this video a thumbs up. Share with your friends on Facebook, Twitter, and other social networking channels. And until next time, cheers. Hey, if you like my review, be sure to check out these other whiskey videos.